Call Action Network Change Choir, give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally for you that are here live in the House of Justice. And you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, and you that are here in the House of Justice, we are happy to be with you another Saturday morning where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. Our regional director, Minister Kirsten John Ford. And so many of our guests this morning, we certainly were uh, honored to have with us this morning and will be part of our forum with Don Jones, the Manhattan Board President, Gail Brewer. And uh, Gail Brewer is, is uh, Gail must be religious because she's omnipresent. She everywhere <laughs> at the same time very active and very much present and we're always glad when she's at the House of Justice and certainly to uh, our district attorney in Kings County, Eric Gonzalez. I, I did not remember uh, meeting him at 21, <laughs> nor did I remember that he uh, worked for Ada Smith. Ada and I grew up together. Uh, Ada worked for Shirley Chisholm when I was her youth, uh, Shirley Chisholm's youth director when she was president. And the biggest uh, contest that Ada Smith and Victor Robles and I had was we would all try to get out of the way for who had to hold Mrs. Chisholm's pocketbook while she was speaking. <laughs> And uh, Ada didn't want to hold it. I was a little boy trying to act rough. I sure didn't want to hold it. So we would always try to duck so Victor would be stuck with the pocketbook. But Ada went on to the state legislature, uh, and I heard Eric saying he was the young man, 21, that was sitting at the table with us. What he didn't tell you is I was 19, but that was... <laughs> Even if it wasn't true, you running for office, you're supposed to help, you know, buttress it up a little bit to after September. He is supported by many uh, people that we respect, Reverend Dr. A.R. Bernard and, and others, uh, and uh, certainly no one has more regard in this house than uh, our own sister, Bertha Lewis. Stand up, Bertha, as well. And I want to say this, and we're going live on TV, television, man. I want to say this, though. The thing that I think is important, and I warn uh, Reverend Marshall and McCall and others, when uh, Eric talks about coalition, uh, we certainly have believed in blacks and browns and whites and others coalescing. And I remember in 1999 when we had all as a city stood against police misconduct and for 13 days went to jail protesting the death by police of uh, Amadou Diallo. And even former Mayor Dinkins went to jail with us and Congressman Rangel and Attorney Hardy was our attorney. So about uh, two years later, I remember I was riding to the Saturday Action Rally and heard on the radio uh, that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. and Dennis Rivera, labor leader at the time, had been arrested protesting Navy bombings in Vieques. And I said that they, in the Latino leadership, stood went to jail with us. I wanted to go down and take a stand. And I went down, I called uh, three of our leaders and colleagues and went with them to Puerto Rico. We went and sat in a Navy base and they arrested uh, us 
and uh, we had this great coalition till we got to court. And the judge gave the three Latino leaders 40 days and gave me 90 days. Eric, something about that coalition didn't work for me. But one of my cellmates is one of Eric's advisors. So I just want him to know he got one of my cellies. I, I don't know how that works out, brother, for one of my fellow inmates telling us who we should do for the prosecutor. That's kind of awkward, ain't it? But he and I did time together. Stand up, brother Roberto Ramirez sitting in the back. Now, we'll say this to Roberto, and many of you know, was Bronx County leader and Big Shot. He got out in 40 days, and uh, he made me eat. I had fasted. He made me eat before he left. And before I could sell in it, I was going to have to do these 50 days alone. They told me that uh, I had to come back down to visitors because I had a new lawyer. I said, a new lawyer? How is my lawyer? He said, no, you got a new lawyer. And I went back downstairs, and my new lawyer was attorney, Roberto Ramirez. And he visited me every day as my new attorney. So he did not leave me alone. Glad to see all of these uh, in the house. Let, let me say that it is very important. Let me recognize uh, also, before we go on the TV uh, part of this, that we have several birthdays this week I want to acknowledge. First, I want to acknowledge the uh, birthday of Ilyasa Shabazz, one of the daughters of Malcolm X, celebrated birthday this week. And one of the young men that served time in jail for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, he is one of the Central Park Five. He did. 15 years in jail and till it came out that they were not guilty and they matched DNA with someone in jail and said yes they're the ones that did this despicable act. Donald Trump did four page ads saying that they should go to the death penalty and never back up and to this day say he disagrees with the DNA. I'm going to get to Trump in a minute. But I want to wish a happy birthday to our brother. And he came to Nan because we stood with him and marched for him. And he came and worked here three years. Couldn't get a job anywhere. So we told him, you can work right here. And he's been here every Saturday since he's gone on May the Settlement, building a justice thing. Happy birthday, Corey White. birthday of my oldest daughter, the producer of our broadcast, head of membership, Dominique Shaw. So you notice I didn't give Dominique or Corey's age, so they got to take me to lunch. It is important as we deal with the challenges of our time that we are focused on what is important. And what is important and what is going to impact our community and people the most. And that's what I want to get in this morning because we're dealing with a lot of politics of distraction. And we are in an age of reality TV where everything is based on personality rather than on principles and values and things that matter. Anybody that just thinks this is about who you like, I don't care if it's the DA or the board president or president, you must measure them by who best serves the interests of those they are supposed to serve. Bible talks about who is the greatest in the kingdom. And he said the servant is the greatest in the kingdom. One of the reasons why every Saturday when we see a real servant walk in like Bishop Herbert Daughtry, yeah. 
He ranks above all of our elections. Give this a hand. Because it don't matter to me what title you got. It matters to me what you do with your title. I met presidents, head dictators, all of that. And I've also seen them go. Ain't nothing more pathetic than an ex-big shot. A former big shot. Where you had to tell your daughters he used to be something. And he run around telling old war stories about what he used to be. But can't tell you what he used to do. Because if you had done something. You wouldn't have to tell nobody what you used to be. Your works would speak for itself. You know, I used to be the head of the county, so and so and so. Only reason you got to tell that is you didn't do nothing in the county. <laughs> don't you remember what I know? I don't remember. You didn't do nothing. I'm trying to forget you was there. But work and service is irreplaceable. That's why I tell our young folk here at National Action Network, if you really want to achieve something, outwork everybody. Outorganize. Outperform in terms of serving people like the Garden family. This is not about who can get the biggest profile on social media. It's about how we serve. And that is one of the things that is the perversion of this generation, is that we do not serve. Let us welcome our national audience now on, that, on Impact Television. We're so glad to be with them. Another Saturday morning from the House of Justice. Let, let me say at first and foremost that we are so happy that many of our ministers around the country are really rallying to be part of the 1,000 Ministers March this August 28th. Bishop Rudy McKissick from Jacksonville, Bishop Herbert Daughtry, Reverend Fred Haynes, all of them have called this week and said, we're coming, we're marching on that day. It is the anniversary of Martin Luther King making the speech that became his start, I Have a Dream. And the basic tenets of that dream was fighting poverty, fighting for voting rights, fighting for criminal justice reform, as well as dealing with the critical issue of health. Those are all threatened today. So on the day, on the 54th anniversary of that march and that speech, we're asking for people across religious lines, spiritual leaders, 1,000 of them, to march with us from Dr. King's monument all the way to the Justice Department to appeal to them don't be a dream buster. <laughs> now, that dream should not be in any way tarnished or not abided by, no matter who's in office. There's some things bigger than party politics. Poverty shouldn't have nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. Criminal justice shouldn't have nothing to do with Democrat or Republican. Voting rights should be above party lines. Health care, and I'm going to get into that in my message. So I'm very honored this morning that we have with us one of our leading Buddhist leaders in on the globe. His Holiness, the Gal Wang Drukpa, is with us, and he's endorsing and supporting the march. Let's hear a few words from his Holiness. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend L. Uh, Sharpton and also everybody to have all of us over here and uh, especially uh, our delegation and myself coming from Himalaya which is very far away from here but we have similar problems sometimes over there also 
and I have a special mission for this sort of uh, uh, problem to sort out and all these things based on uh, understanding has to be uh, has to be developed and uh, we have to really be out of the uh, conservativeness and get out on the street and work for the people. Yeah. 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 We, yes, we as a religious people, we have to really be, how do you say, uh, uh, put every prayers and meditations and concentrations, everything into the active uh, phenomena to 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 have it in action, love in action, faith in action, and also meditation in action to help those people who are very badly needed to needed the help, because there are many people who are needing very badly the help from the religious community and spiritual community but most of the spiritual people most of the religious people maybe including me we are not doing enough we, we always have to uh, of course without disrespecting the uh, prayers without disrespecting the meditation but we physically have to go out, interact with the people, and save the people. And give them, give them the shelter, give them whatever they want, medical facilities, and also the facilities of uh, uh, human rights, and all the rights that we used to pray for. But that is not enough, because the prayer will be answered, but little late. So therefore we have to <laughs> uh, uh, get, the, get, the, get the things done practically. So therefore I am very happy that you guys have been working for many many years for the justice and I am also very honored to be invited over here to sort of work together. So therefore may I sort of prayer or may I wish that one day everybody in, on this earth will have a justice. And, and also on, the, on top of everything, you, are, you guys are talking about the marching and that is a, such a beautiful, peaceful thing that we should do for the justice, purpose of justice. And we in Himalaya, back in the Himalaya, and leading by myself, I have been doing so-called patiatra, which means the marching for kilometers and miles, thousands of miles across the Himalayan region. We walk for the peace and for the justice. And same thing I wish and I really hope that I can do the similar thing to support you guys here in New York or in some part of America also as a contribution. That's what I hope and my best wishes and prayers and blessings. Thank you. We certainly receive his prayers and his blessings. You that are a minister and want to be part of the march. Now, it's not going to be, I don't want him to escape. We're not going to do thousands of miles that day. We're going from Martin Luther King's memorial to the Justice Department, about a mile. Call right now, 1-877-626-4651. We will sign you in to our law. The people at the phone now, if you want to be one of those thousand ministers that march that day. There are also those that have problems and need some direction. You may have an injustice, you may have an unfairness in your city, your town. Or you may just need prayer. Some folks just need to get through a crisis. 
need to get through a situation, somebody to talk to. This organization is civil rights, but it's religious based. We have prayer warriors right at the phone, right now, waiting to pray with you and to help you and to support you even in a crisis. Call 1-877-626-4651, one 626 5-1. Let me say before I get into my message, on yesterday, President Donald Trump spoke in Long Island in front of some law enforcement people. And it was to address the problem of gangs and crime, something that all of us want to see dealt with. We are not adverse at all to dealing with stopping criminal behavior that plagues our community first and foremost. The problem that we have in our community is that those that we trust to fight crime must also be accountable if they go over the line and commit a crime themselves. Now, I don't believe all police are bad. I don't even believe most are bad. But those that are bad need to be held accountable just like citizens must be held accountable. We do not harbor criminals, and good police shouldn't harbor bad police. So as we have developed and fought down through the years, these movements, we finally was able under President Obama to begin to deal with some of the issues of police accountability. And the president had a president's commission on policing. They came out with recommendations about having policemen wearing body cameras and about dealing with those cities that had a pattern and practice of police abuse that the government, the federal government would have to take over and deal with that. And we began to see movement toward police reform after many years of people trying to act as though this was not an issue. But now here comes the Trump administration. First thing is the Attorney General, Sessions. At least he was Attorney General when I went on the air. I guess he's still. I'm not looking at my Twitter feed, but. He was a few minutes ago. He said, I'm going to try to stop certain consent decrees. And dealing with police accountability is bad for morale. And on and on. But yesterday, the statements made by the president to law enforcement was a reckless disregard for the law and set a tone that is dangerous and biased in this country. To tell law enforcement, don't be worried about treating people they arrest with any kind of gentleness. Don't put their head down when you put them in the car. First of all, Mr. President, people that are arrested are not even convicted. The reason it undermines the law is you've already robbed them of the presumption of innocence. Anyone arrested, the policeman, is not the judge, the jury, and the executioner. By what authority are you telling them to treat them brutal? When even if they're convicted, they ought not be treated brutal, but they haven't even been convicted of a crime. For a policeman to sit there and clap at that shows the mentality that some of us are questioning. What is nothing funny about joking about hurting people that had not even stood before the bar of justice? And if those that are enforcing the law think there's something funny about that, then we are in an even more dangerous position than that. Oh, he, he was just joking. 
Well, it corresponds with his policies. It corresponds with him taking ads out, saying give the death penalty to five boys in Central Park, one of them here this morning, that went to jail for years for a crime they didn't commit. Him playing tough, him playing rough, and they were found innocent. And you look at Eric Garner's mother here this morning. Yes. Gwen Carr, yes. son choked to death by police. Are you saying to him, yet yeah, be rough with them? Yes. This kind of rough kind of justice is to assume that a policeman has a right to decide how and who gets justice on the spot. That is not why we have a criminal justice system. But then on top of that, what was so interesting to me is that everybody missed this. Is he said when you put them in the quote paddy wagon. Paddy wagon is a racial slur against the Irish. I remember many years ago we used that term and God told me you can't say that and went through the history of how they used to call the police vans paddy wagons after Patrick the name and they would act like all the Irish were drunk and they put them in the car. For the President of the United States to stand up and joke with a racial slur and nobody opens their mouth shows you how low the bar has gone in holding accountability for the highest office in this land. September three weeks ago, so y'all press get this right. This invitation I already had. And I've been reading a lot about how the Irish worked with Frederick Douglass even in the days of the abolitionist movement. And how the Irish were involved in all of the movements since Douglass. So when I saw him say that, my antennas went up, and I just knew it was going to be an issue. Nobody said a word. And trying to poo-poo him talk, telling police who clapped. Who clapped. Who smiled and applauded. While he talked about them going against not only their training, but to presuppose the law. It's a sad day when people think that it's all right to use racial slurs and to gesture in this climate. Let's not forget something now. Gray died in Baltimore as a result of a rough ride by police. That's what the Gray case was about. In the same Baltimore that he, the Attorney General, said that he wanted to delay the consent decree. Well, I guess so. If y'all run around joking, telling cops, go ahead and be rough, just throw their heads in. Doesn't matter if you hit them or not. I think that we have got to go to Washington and make a stand that this is no joking matter. And if the religious leaders don't stand up, if the spiritual leaders don't stand up, if those that claim that they know God are afraid to stand up, God and fear doesn't dwell in the same place. One of the ways you can tell that you reach the level of spiritual maturity is that you lose all fear, you cast out fear. Scared folk cannot be a vehicle 
for divine work. Everybody that is called in any scripture, the first thing they have to do is lose their feet. And the reason why a lot of our political leaders, even in the black and Latino community, are ineffective is they scared. Well, you know, I've got a different strategy. No, you scared. Well, I'm, I'm going to do it a different way. No, you scared. You don't need no strategy to tell folk to don't choke somebody to death when they say it 11 times I can't breathe. You don't need a strategy to tell people you don't shoot people in the back that are unarmed. This ain't hard. And when you look that we send, then those bullets take advantage of that. Because all a bully wants is to know that he can bully you. I learned growing up that they say dogs can smell fear. The more you run, the more the dog will chase you. Little chihuahua. <laughs> be running a six foot five, 300 pound man down the block. And that's what happened in Washington. You got these little political chihuahuas running y'all all over the county. How do you sit empowered by the people? and afraid to speak up for the people that empowered you. Well, one of the things that I was studying this week, and I was looking at, and, and, and it brought me to mind when I was watching this uh, disaster going on in, in Washington with the uh, White House. You know, y'all thought this was the, uh, the, the whole fight of what was it, rivals that Lincoln did, team of rivals. When Trump first went in, team of rivals. Bannon's team on one side, Range Priebus team on the other. But now it done turned into just the hay fields. They just run around hacking and chopping. I mean, this is worse than a reunion down my mother's hometown, Dover, Alabama. Homeboy come in one day talking to mess, calling cussing report out. Yes. This is the standard you set for our children. Yes. Reverend, these are the ones y'all put your hands on and anoint and pray for, talking the vulgarity that we hear. And you too afraid to stand up for decency? Well, what calling did you get? Oh, 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 oh. Come you can excuse and justify vulgarity and obscenity. But people like me that raises questions of civil rights and human rights, you don't know if that's in the word. Well, what word do you read? You embrace the vulgar and you run from those that stand up for justice. But I ain't surprised because they did it to all those in the body. Let me tell you something. I, I was reading this week. There's a, 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 a whole science called epistemology. And epistemology talks about what makes you you in terms of your rooting, in terms of why you have certain instincts and reaction and all of that. And your epistemological background defines your resulting personality. Yeah. It's part of that. Yeah. Now, the reason why that becomes important, I was talking to a conservative young man, and he told me, I don't understand why y'all keep going back to slavery in the black community? 
why don't we deal with today and get over it? And I told them, well, let, let's deal with today. Let's deal with today. My mother, I ain't talking about in slavery, my mother right. that raised me yeah. came from Dothan, Alabama yeah. to New York right. because they were trying to find a way that they could make a living and not have to deal with segregation. My father came from Wabasa, Florida for the same thing. There was a migration of Southern blacks that came north looking for a better life. They didn't go over here to see the Statue of Liberty. They didn't go over here to see the Empire State Building. They came up here to seek a way to make a living and to live where they could ride the front of the bus and sit in the restaurant, go to a hotel. That's why they escaped the South. My parents met here and married and had me and my sister. So I was raised and born in the North by Southern migrants. When I became old enough to go to school, they could not help me with my homework because where they came from, they had to go to the black school which was three miles from the house where the white school was a half mile from the house and they either had to walk past the white school to go to the black school or they didn't go to school at all. If they rode a bus, they had to ride in the back. There was only two restaurants in town they were not allowed to eat there. I was raised by people that were denied until their adult life basic human dignity. You want to talk about today, you're looking at the son of one who was forced into state-sponsored illiteracy and lack of the right to vote. I ain't talking about slavery. We're just one generation in the voting. That's why I'm marching about voting.
Don't forget, we marched thousands of us against stop and frisk. Why? Because suspects were being stopped by police because of the color of their skin. And most of them were found to have committed no crime. But according to Trump, they should have been rough on them. Well, how do you explain the percentage of people stopped and frisked in New York that did nothing? You want them to be rough on them? But he said stop and frisk should be a national policy. Said that we ought to have stop and frisk nationwide. Crime went down. Crime has gone down more since the ending or the lessening of stop and frisk than it did before. Talk about fake news, fake data, Mr. President. We need to deal with facts. And we need to, everybody in here, you need to think about the sociological environment of your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents. And think about their social setting, their schooling, their ability to socialize, their going to church or wherever they would go. All of that shaped them and was passed on to you as they raised you and taught you as an infant. Yes. A lot of us are very judgmental on our parents and never think about the conditions that they were dealing with. Well, my mama didn't understand a lot because she couldn't go to school. My daddy didn't leave me nothing because he couldn't make money. And we were given this. It also gives us an obligation. That's why I tell people to call the prayer line. And because a lot of that inbuilt tension is passed down because from generation to generation that unsettlement. People talk about a lot of black folk are hyper. If you had to deal with what we had to deal with and survive, you'd be hyper too. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know, I'm stressed out. If you had to make ends meet, had a $6,000 a month need and a $3,000 a month income, that ain't stress, that's poverty. You talking about, do you got a budget? I ain't got no money. Budget is where you grew up. Well, how do you pay the rent? We knew the 72 hour eviction notice quicker than we knew the rent, man. <laughs> that environment is what creates. But at the same time, that same kind of environment can inspire you to rise above your circumstances. That's why the spiritual kicks in. That God will rise you and raise you above your circumstances. You first need to know your circumstance, acknowledge it, so that he can raise you up. But then once you are raised up, you are raised so you can help raise others and to correct the environment that is wrong. January 12, 1991. We get ready to march in Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. They killed a young man named Yusuf Hawkins. And we marched out there about 21 weeks. Why did we march? Because we said the folk in the neighborhood know who did it. There was a mob out there and we wanted to put pressure on them to come forward. That day, Saturday morning, we got out the car, Moses Stewart, Yusuf Hawkins' father, yeah. and a man ran through the police line, stuck a knife in my chest. Yeah. Yeah. Every morning I get up shaved, this morning, I still look at the surgical scar where they had to operate to make sure that I was all right after that knife wound. Yeah. Oh, 
I told you about how I went to jail with Roberto around the ages. So every morning I get up and I wake up and look at that scar and realize that I was supposed to have been gone in 91. And then I get out of the bed and walk to the bathroom and there ain't no bars in the room. Well, I got to ask a CO, can I go out like I did when I was in jail for protesting the acres? So every day I wake up and I can walk out, I don't have bad days. Amen. If you think of your worst day, then you'll get up and make every day a better day. Because whatever you've been through, God brought you through. And why did God bring you through? He didn't bring you through the wallet in a pity party. He brought you through so he can raise you higher and higher. <laughs> Quit sitting around having a pity party. Quit sitting around feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah, people do you wrong. You've been done wrong before. You got through it then, you can do it now. Yeah, you got a no good partner. You had no good partners before. Same way you drop them, drop this and keep going. My feelings hurt. Your feelings been hurt before. Oh, is your are you glad you still got feelings? That's why the Bible said, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor. Nowhere in the Bible did it say we weren't going to have fights. Nowhere in the Bible did it say we were not going to be in battle. That's why I said put on the whole armor of God. Because if you put on the armor, it will protect you against the wiles of the devil. That's why I'm not afraid of them because I've been armed and protected. And the same God that was there in the days of Moses and David and those in the Bible is still on the throne. And some of y'all are reacting to Trump, but Trump cannot stop the powers that nature directed by God would bring us to. I've seen things worse than Trump, and we got through him, and we'll get through Trump. Sad times. Can you imagine? <laughs> Folk gonna go in the U.S. Senate and knowingly vote to take away people's health care. People sitting up on respirators. People sitting up on machines keeping their lives going. And to score some cheap political points, you're going to snatch their health care and their ability to continue to be serviced in terms of whatever condition they have. But that's why I, I, I'm a man of faith, is, uh, your holiness, because sometimes God will use unexpected things. You know, faith is stuff that's not expected. Faith is stuff you didn't see coming. Faith is when you say, Lord, make a way, and you don't even know how you're going to get out of this jam. But he make a way anyhow. I was raised by a woman of faith. I, I, you know, Father left when I was nine. We was doing all right. He left. We lost everything. But I never had a hungry day. I never figured out how Mama made a way to have dinner. But I know she prayed every morning. And by dinner time, there was food on the table. 
And the only thing she would say is say your blessings for you eat. Because thank God he put food on the table. I know he's able. Some of y'all ain't never been there. Well, I looked and I couldn't believe they were going to vote to take this health care from millions of people. 22 million never had health care. And I went back and thought about Bishop Daughtry how in 2012 and then 2008, Barack Obama had run for president promising health care. Show you how God works. He ran in the primaries against Hillary Clinton, who had tried to give health care and they defeated her in the night. He won against Hillary and became the nominee. And he ran against John McCain. And John McCain and him fought all over this country. The economy collapsed. He beat John McCain. Fast forward the other night when Obama came. When the Affordable Care Act that Barack Obama brought through that Hillary Clinton couldn't bring through. When they were ready to vote it out, the same John McCain that he beat in 2008 got up off his cancer-stricken bed and walked to the well of the Senate and said that I vote no and save the Obama case. that he would allow it 
is to show us no matter what they do to you, I can bring you back anyhow. The only reason that we can believe in the resurrection is because we went through a crucifixion. And anybody that believe in a rising Christ can't be afraid of no cross that the world can put on. I'm not unafraid of the powers in Washington because I'm stupid. I'm unafraid because I believe that they got the nails and the cross. But I got the spirit of the resurrection. I can't stop you from laying me down. But you can't stop God from lifting me up. that God has already written the script. You think you there to stop us but you're there to show the strength that if my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and see my face and turn from the wicked way then right then I will heal the land. I've come to tell you is an example of the spiritual possibilities of us rising never to fall again. I want you to stand up wherever you are and declare the victory over whatever situation you got. Declare the victory over your circumstance. He didn't bring us this far to leave us now. I want all of us to be committed. Yeah. It's rough time. Yeah. But rough riders are made for rough time. Yeah. And those of us that have the faith, he has the power. Yeah. He has the power in a fiery furnace yeah. with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. He has the power in a lion's den yeah. with a Daniel. Yeah. He has the power on a Calvary with a Jesus. Yeah. The same God is still on the throne. That's why we stand. That's why we march. They killed Dr. King. But every town you go in, there's streets named after him. Monuments on the Potomac River. The whole country closes for his birthday because he promised he'd give us eternal life. Who would have ever thought when Lincoln looks out of his memorial and Jefferson looks to the side of his memorial and Washington looks down from his monument. They be looking at the memorial of a black practice preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, who never held office, who never ran an election. But God said, if you be faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. It is our day. It is our time. Stand up and claim your victory. Everybody sing Everybody sing Everybody sing Everybody sing
moment, there may be someone here hears us on the radio, watches the television program, but never joined National Action Network. If you're here today and want to become a member of this organization, all you have to do is come down either aisle and take my hand and let us sign you up to National Action Network this morning. Won't you come right now? Just don't look at anybody else, just come on and become a member of the organization. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Quickly, we have a forum here. 